good afternoon everyone for making it to today's webinar thank you so much for making time to join us today we are really excited to have you on board we promise that today's webinar is going to be very insightful um some of you here i'm sure joined us during our last webinar on prostate cancer this month is breast cancer awareness month and we are helping to drive that awareness through this webinar we thank you so much that you've made the time to be able to join us but before we start with our with our presentation i'd like to give you a brief about who we are as an organization saint lab ghana is a radiology and laboratory services provider so we do offer laboratory services we do have about six thousand five hundred tests that we do as an organization and then also we offer radiology services, which includes ultrasound, spirometry, ECG, echo, um, and many more. Aside that, we also offer clinic services. So we have various specialists, you know, coming in um, to attend to you as a patient, from dermatologists to dietitians to cardiologists to ops and gynees, you know, all available at your service. Um, we are ISO accredited. We are Europe's number one. Our headquarters is in Germany, and we are in about 36 countries and counting. Um, in, in Africa, in two countries, Nigeria and Ghana. And in Ghana, we have 14 locations, 14 locations spread across the regions. We're in Goso, Techiman, Sunyane, Kofuidria, Kumase, Takrade, Takwa, um, Brekum. In Accra, we have about five branches and we are in Tema as well. We do offer health insurance cards. I mean, we do accept health insurance cards. And then there are two products I'd like to talk about, which is the home service. So you can be in the comfort of your home or your office. You can call on us to come and sample you. And then also we do have gift vouchers. Gift vouchers that you can buy to give to a loved one you know, to come in just to do a test to make sure that they are well and fit. Aside that, as a company, there are three things we pride ourselves in, and it is accuracy and the quality of the results that we churn out. The accuracy and quality of the results that we churn out, as well as affordability. So, you know, we always think about your pocket and pricing our products. Now, going on to today's webinar, um, the person who will be bringing us the webinar for today is our very own Dr. Baita Samoa. Dr. Samoa is the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Radiologist here at Senlab Ghana. He's been with the company for about four years and he's got 15 years experience in clinical practice. I'm sure you all know him. He's um, well known for the Vodafone Health Line. He used to be a host on that program. The webinar is going to take about 45 minutes to an hour of him giving us insightful, insightful information. And then once he's done, he would allow for questions. I urge you to ask as many questions as you can. We're here for you. You feel free to, you know, unmute yourself and ask your question or drop your question in the message box or in the chat box and we'll read it out for you. Once he's done, now he would ask two questions and the first two people to key in the questions correctly in the message box or in the chat box receive a price so the price is the two people that get it can come in to do a breast ultrasound for free you come in to do a breast ultrasound for free so that's what we have on offer um i'll be handing over you over to dr samoa soon but i'd like to give a last announcement I'd like to mention that on the 21st of October this month, next week, Saturday, the Saturday after this week, we will be having a program here in our head office um, dubbed When Men Talk About Breast. When Men Talk About Breast. And we're doing this in collaboration with Mr. Pratt, you know, where we have a lot of men coming in with their spouses. So we urge you all to come in with your spouses. Um, let's talk about the pairs that we all love. You know, so come in and during that event, there's going to be a free breast screening examination and then a very huge discount also given on our breast ultrasound test. So I urge you all to come 
um let's make this event um, very impactful to each other let's encourage each other we hope to see you on the 21st of october and it starts at 8 30 a.m at the head office at south lagon thank you very much i'll hand you over to the presenter for today dr bright over to you thank you so i'd like to welcome all of us to this presentation um like abigail said this presentation is about breast cancer and breast cancer is a condition that touches and affects all of us either through our family our friends our colleagues even ourselves and i think it's an it's an important topic that we all should pay rapt attention to and try and learn as much as possible than we can so without much ado again my name is dr bright samoa i'm the chief medical officer for Silab ghana and i'm quite pleased to make this presentation to all of you who have tuned in so the so by way of uh, outline we'll be looking at the introduction where we just talk briefly about uh, breast cancer awareness and what it means to us we'll look at some statistics both globally and in ghana we'll also talk about the anatomy of the breast because since we talk about breast cancer, it's very key that we know what the breast looks like, what uh, constitutes the breast that we're talking about. We'll also talk about breast cancer and the, the various types of breast cancer that we have. We'll also look at the risk factors, things that increase your chances or your predisposition to developing breast cancer. We'll talk, we'll talk about gene mutations, because as we go through the presentation, you realize that there are certain genes that increase your risk of you developing breast cancer. We'll look at the signs and symptoms that we need to look out for to see if perhaps you're at risk of, or what you're experiencing could be linked to breast cancer or not. Then we'll look at the various means of diagnosis and the treatment modalities that are available for us here in Ghana. Okay, so, October is a month that we have dubbed the Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and the goal is to be able to create awareness around breast cancer. Um, so you find that individuals and organizations come together to you know, create as much noise or as much awareness about breast cancer uh, as much as possible. Now, during this month, we also like to obviously celebrate those who have uh, fought and won the battle against uh, breast cancer. That's the survivors. We also look to, you know, support those who are going through the the battle, you know, those who are going through breast cancer. And obviously, we'd like to remember those who also fought gallantly uh, against breast cancer, but unfortunately lost uh, the battle to breast cancer. However, it's, it's very key that we nonetheless keep spreading the awareness and the knowledge, and we believe that this would make a big difference in the fight against breast cancer. So by way of statistics, we'll not just want to take a look at it from the global perspective, okay, before we zoom into the Ghana's, uh, you know, statistics with, with, with regard to breast cancer. So first thing is that breast cancer is a global health issue. It's not a cancer or a, a condition that's affecting only Ghana or a select few countries, but it's a condition that's affecting every country at a global level. And, you know, most cancers, uh, in this case, you find that the cancer is affecting both the developed nations, the developing nations. It truly cuts across and it's not, you know, distinguished by levels of development or socioeconomic status of the various countries. Now, it also affects people of all backgrounds. So it really doesn't matter what your background is in terms of religion, uh, level of employment or education, you, nobody is exempt. Also affects people of all ages. And you realize that I keep saying people and persons because uh, breast cancer affects both men and women. So it doesn't again segregate in terms of gender. We are all at risk. Now, in the year 2020, we had about 2.3 million new cases of breast cancer diagnosed worldwide. And that's a huge number, 2.3 million cases. And out of this 2.3 million cases, we had Six, six, 685,000 deaths. That's about 30% of these diagnosed cases actually dying that same year in 2020 
as a result of breast cancer. So we find that worldwide breast cancer is one of the leading causes of cancer and also the leading cause of cancer deaths amongst uh, persons who are inflicted with the condition. So these numbers really reflect the kind of burden and the responsibility we have in the fight against uh, breast cancer. And again, breast cancer has no borders, no boundaries. We are all very much at risk, no matter where we find ourselves. Now in Ghana, you know, the statistics, at least that we've been able to collate, and I always say this with a pinch of salt because the data we have is in, indeed not complete or entire or proper or probably an, a clear reflection of what really, really exists on the ground. So we have over 4,000 women who are diagnosed with breast cancer every year in Ghana. And unfortunately, we have more than 50% of these people, these women who die as a result of breast cancer, more than 50%, and that's too high. And the next point explains why we have a huge number of women dying in Ghana from breast cancer. And this is because we have about 70% of these women being diagnosed, uh, who, who identified having late stage cancer. In other words, the breast cancer, by the time they come to the hospital, has advanced, okay? So we have early stage cancers and we have late or advanced stage cancers. And unfortunately, most of our women, 70% of them, have advanced stage cancer by the time they are found to have breast cancer. And this has been linked to either the lack of awareness, you know, we still have as much uh, noise we make around breast cancer, we still have a lot of women who are to some extent ignorant or unaware of breast cancer. And this contributes to the high death rates. We also have a lot of women who, when they are diagnosed with breast cancer, they are always in a state of denial. They just do not believe that it can happen to them or they feel that it's far from them. That state of denial results in, again, the late you know, diagnosis or the late uh, you know, treatment given to them uh, when the diagnosis is made at an earlier stage. A lot of people also in fear. Some people choose not to even go and check if they perhaps uh, have or don't have breast cancer. But the fact that they're afraid to know or to hear that, oh, you have breast cancer is, is too detrimental that they would rather not go and check. Some also have a lot of misconceptions around breast cancer. And a key factor, which is the lack of available screening facilities, the facilities that will help people to check effectively whether they have anything that could be breast cancer is also really not available. And then when you do diagnose these conditions, the lack of available effective treatment, because if there's no effective treatment, you find that a lot more people who could have otherwise survived the, the disease end up actually dying as a result of the disease. So these are the statistics in Ghana. The likelihood is that these numbers could be much bigger, you know, based on uh, those people who probably don't end up in the hospital for their data to be picked up. So indeed these numbers could be much more than is actually being reflected now a key thing to understanding breast cancer is to, un to understand the anatomy of the breast so with the diagram on the on this side we have more like an animated diagram of the breast and i'll start in terms of describing or explaining the anatomy from the outside so we all know the nipple and the dark area around the nipple, which is called the areola. Then we have a lot of these small ducts, which all converge to enter or to converge into the area of the nipple, okay? And when you trace these ducts, they are originating from something we call the lobule or the lobe, these ovoid structures here. And obviously these ovid structures have smaller components called the alveoli. So it's in the lobules that the milk is produced and the milk flows through the, the ducts to the nipple in the time when the, the mother or the woman is pregnant. Then the majority of the breast is actually made up of fat. So all these yellow uh, structures you see here are all fat cells or fat tissue, okay? And within the fat tissue there are these white strands 
which are known as the suspensory ligaments. And the suspensory ligament is basically important for keeping the shape and of uh, the shape of the breast and to prevent it from sagging. So these are the things that hold the structure of the breast. So key things I'd like us to note, the lobules, which are these ovoid structures, the ducts, which flow all the way into the nipple, and indeed the fat structures around them. At the back of the breast, we have this muscle, which is known as the chest muscle, the chest muscle. Now, the key thing about all these structures that you're seeing here is that they can all develop a cancer. And once there are structures with relation to the breast, then they can all develop a cancer, which we refer to as breast cancer. Now, the diagram I have here on the right is these green structures. And if you look carefully, there are these round structures and each round structure being connected by a thin channel, okay? So this whole system is called the lymphatic system. And the round parts of the lymphatic system are what we call the lymph nodes. And the things that connect the lymph nodes are known as the lymph vessels. Now, the reason I've shown this picture is that this, these structures play a very important role in the spread of the cancer. So when they say the cancer has spread, it spreads through or via these systems or these, these structures, which is the lymphatic system. So it's also very important, therefore, to add, which in the case that the lymphatic system helps to advise the kind of treatment that would be available for you. So in the case that we check the lymph nodes and there's no spread to the lymph nodes, the treatment is different. If it's spread to just one, two, or three lymph nodes, the, the treatment again is different. But once the cancer is spread to more than that or to a quite a number of them in different locations, again, that informs a different, a different or a different level of treatment. So at least we now know how the breast anatomy looks. So the next thing is that what is breast cancer? And simply simple put, the cancers, a cancer that develops within the cells of the breast tissue. And we already know that a cancer from at least the last presentation, the prostate cancer, is that every cancer is as a result of cells that have become abnormal, and as a result, they are growing uncontrollably. So the cells within the breast that begin to grow uncontrollably result in breast cancer. And the, un un the uncontrollable growth of these cells results in what we call a tumor. And a tumor is just the collection of those cells that one place forming a mass such that that's why we always say as soon as you feel a lump which would be the, the the cells that have come together to form a mass then we suspect that that lump or that mass could be a cancerous tumor so you find that in this picture here we have the normal appearance of the breast okay but when you get to this point you find that there is a mass or a tumor that has developed and that is reflected in this picture here so you can see the lobules and in this particular lobule it looks bigger than normal and that is the tumor that which sometimes you can feel when you examine your breasts and a key thing like i mentioned before is that breast cancer affects both men and women we are both we're all at risk both men and women and the unfortunate thing is that Till date, we have no specific known cause for breast cancer. There is no specific cause of breast cancer. Now, I'll touch a little bit on um, the types of cancer. I think this is me going a little bit scientific, but then uh, it's at least good that we know that the structure of the breast and the things within the breast actually determine the type of cancer that you are having. And based on that, it also determines that whether the cancer is more aggressive than another or this is probably a more manageable form of cancer. So the most common cancer of the breast we have is known as the invasive ductal carcinoma. The invasive ductal carcinoma. So if you remember that the anatomy of the breast, we have the nipple here, then we have the ducts, and then we have the lobules. Okay, so the invasive ductal carcinoma, you hear, you realize that this is the duct right here. And within the duct, we have a carcinoma or a cancer developing. Now, you realize that this cancer has gone beyond the duct. It's gone beyond the duct. 
and therefore it's called invasive. In other words, it's begun to invade areas outside the duct. And this is a common, uh, the most common type of cancer that we find. Then the second most common one is known as the lobular carcinoma in situ. Lobular carcinoma in situ. So this is a cancer that develops within the lobe or within the lobule and it stays within the lobule, okay? It develops within the lobule and most of the time stays within the lobule. That's the second most common type. Then we have the ductal carcinoma institute, the ductal carcinoma institute. This also is just within the duct, the duct uh, of the breast. And again, this also does not spread beyond the milk ducts. It stays within the milk duct most of the time. And then again, we have what we call the invasive lobular carcinoma. So here we have the lobular carcinoma institute where it's within the lobule. And then we have the invasive lobular carcinoma, which invades and goes beyond the boundaries of the lobule, okay? Then we have less common types of um, breast cancer. We have what we call the triple negative breast cancer. The triple negative breast cancer now, this cancer, though it's less common than these uh, four type, uh, previous types of breast cancer, but the thing about the triple negative breast cancer is that it's more aggressive and it spreads more quickly than these uh, four ones that I've mentioned initially. They also have what we call the inflammatory breast cancer, inflammatory breast cancer. This is more of the breast itself becoming inflamed. So you realize that, uh, you notice a small rash on your skin, on the skin of the breast, then before you realize, the breast begins to change rapidly and become very much like it's swollen or inflamed and it's very, very painful. So these are the types of breast cancer. There are still more types, but these are the common ones that we come across. Now, since we don't know what exactly is the cause of breast cancer, there are, other, there are, however, what we call risk factors. Risk factors means those factors that increase your chances of you developing breast cancer, those things that increase your chances of you uh, developing breast cancer. And before I go to, to that, the first key thing is your gender. So like I said, both male and females are predisposed to breast cancer, but we have cancer being more prevalent or found or diagnosed more in women than in men. So statistically, we have one in eight women being at risk of developing breast cancer in their lifetime. So in a woman's lifetime, there's a one in eight chance that the woman will develop or be diagnosed with breast cancer. That's a very small probability. But when it comes to men, it is a one in thousand. One in thousand men will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. So one in thousand. So it's a huge difference. One in eight versus one in thousand. So it's to say that if you are female, then your chances of developing breast cancer is very high. So the female gender increases your risk of developing breast cancer. Again, the breast cancer risk also increases with age. So as you age, your risk of developing breast cancer also increases. Now we have um, the fact that, yes, we've noticed that cancers occur in those who are 50 years and older. So the older you get, the more the chance, the more the greater the chance of you developing breast cancer. But recently we've noticed that breast cancer is becoming increasingly prevalent in younger women. So women 20 years and above, uh, we're beginning to see the incidence of breast cancer quite more often. So before 50, in the 40s, we are finding that women tend to these category of women tend to develop breast cancer also quite pre uh, frequently. And the sad thing I'd say is that those who develop breast cancer in their young ages, from their 20s up to their late 40s, these cancers tend to some, for some reason, tend to be more aggressive than you'd probably find in the older women. In the younger women, it tends to be more aggressive. And I think that this is a good reason for young women to say that to to not sit down and say that oh i'm young it won't happen to me the thing is that if it does happen you know your chances of survival are quite <laughs> reduced you know for some reason that is associated with breast cancer again the next point is 
if you are on birth control pills, again, your chances of developing breast cancer is increased. This is because these pills tend to be hormonal, okay? And the hormonal uh, aspect of these pills tend to have a way to increase your risk of developing breast cancer compared to another woman who's not using birth control pills. Nonetheless, I should say that if you stop taking the pills uh, in about 10 years, you are, you know, you are no more at risk. So you, after 10 years, you're like a normal person who has never been on birth control pills in terms of your risk exposure to breast cancer. So we also have people who have high levels of hormones. So we have women who, when they enter menopause, they begin to experience all those menopausal symptoms, the hot flashes, the hair falling off. You know, the symptoms are so problematic that we have to put them on what we call hormone replacement therapy. So we put them on this hormone replacement therapy, but it also comes with a risk. Now, once you're put on this uh, kind of hormone replacement, your chances of developing breast cancer is increased, okay? So it's just to mean that once you're on these things, your reason for having regular checks, you know, should be prioritized. Again, persons who are overweight or obese, so if you are obese, in other words, overweight, your risk of developing breast cancer also increases. Now, the reason is that people who are obese have high levels of, should I say, estrogen, the hormone, which if you have prolonged high levels of this, these hormones, it increases again your risk of developing breast cancer. So obesity, hormone replacement therapy, anything that increases or provides extra hormones or increased hormones increases your risk of developing breast cancer. Again, alcohol intake, smoking, all these are linked to uh, the, the increased likelihood of you developing uh, breast cancer. So persons who take alcohol, uh, who smoke, your chances of developing breast cancer is increased as compared to somebody who does not take alcohol nor, nor smoke. Then early menstruation and late menopause, I'll just take this bit by bit, those who have early menstruation, maybe from the age of nine, you start menstruating, you know, your exposure to the female hormones is longer than somebody who starts having menstruation at the age of 13 or 14, okay? So the key thing about breast cancer is that the longer your body is exposed to the female hormones, the the more likelihood the more increased risk you are the more increased risk you are at in developing breast cancer so anything that causes you to be exposed to the female hormones longer increases your chances of developing breast cancer so so for somebody who has early menstruation it means that you started having exposure to the female hormones very early and a woman who has a late stage menopause so in terms of, let's say, if you'd have your menopause at 45, compared to somebody who has menopause at 55 or 60, the person who has that late menopause has had a very long period of exposure to the female hormones, and that person is at risk of developing breast cancer compared to somebody who had an earlier stage of menopause. And then the other factor is a person who has had no pregnancy before or has probably had uh, a late pregnancy a late pregnancy the thing about pregnancy is that when you get pregnant all the female hormones drop to the a very low level so your body is not exposed to those female hormones like somebody who is not pregnant okay so somebody who therefore has three children four children or five children you would have less exposure to those hormones and therefore would be less at risk of developing breast cancer as compared to somebody who throughout her life period has never been pregnant or probably has had a late pregnancy, maybe at 40, then the person decides to get pregnant. So it's to say that getting pregnant is actually protective against breast cancer. 
getting pregnant is actually protective against breast cancer. But indeed, it does not mean that if you have 10 children that you will not, <laughs> it means, it doesn't mean it totally negates the fact that you can actually develop uh, breast cancer. So that is something we should take a note of. So the longer you take in uh, getting menopause, if you have menstruation too early, and if you don't have pregnancies, your chance of uh, getting breast cancer does increase. Now, if you have had a previous breast cancer, let's say you had breast cancer in your left breast, it was treated and everything, you are still at risk of developing another cancer, perhaps the same breast or perhaps in the other breast. So any previous history of breast cancer increases your chances of developing breast cancer again. Now, a family history of breast cancer. So we have what we call second degree relatives and first, first degree relatives and second degree relatives. So if your mother, your sister, or your daughter has had breast cancer, it means that you, uh, that relative, you have an increased risk of developing breast cancer yourself. Okay. Now, if perhaps your auntie, your cousin, um, or your niece has developed breast cancer, which is your second degree relatives, it also means you are still at risk. But the risk of your first degree relative, the risk of your first degree relatives is much greater than your second degree relative. So, if anybody, such as your first degree relative or your second degree relative, has had you know, breast cancer, you also do have a risk of developing uh, breast cancer. Now, the last thing I'll talk about is genetic mutation. There are certain genes that run through the family that can increase your chances of developing breast cancer. And I think it's in the next uh, slide that I'll talk about this extensively. But then if you find yourself to have that gene, it means that your risk of breast cancer is much more increased than a person without that gene. So what we've spoken about here are the risk factors. Now, the fact that even if you don't have the majority, if you don't have any of these, apart from the fact of you being a female, it does not mean that you are exempt or you will not get uh, you know, breast cancer. And you can also have all these factors, but it can also be that you will not develop breast cancer. But once there's always a probability, it's very key and important to know these uh, risk factors so that you can always take precaution. Then, as I was talking about the gene mutations, so these mutation, these gene mutations, what we call BRCA1 and BRCA2, okay, uh, genes that naturally, in the, when they are in their healthy states, they protect uh, your DNA, okay? They protect your DNA, but when you say something has mutated, it means that they've become abnormal. They're not performing the function that they're supposed to perform. Okay. Now, when somebody is found to have any of these mutations, BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutations, it increases significantly their risk for breast cancer. Okay. It increases the risk of breast cancer. Now, how do you get this? gene mutation it can either be inherited from your mother or your father in other words though it's related to breast cancer it can be found in the mother and it can be found in the father and there's a 50 percent chance of passing this uh, gene mutation to either the son or the daughter okay so this BRCA1 gene mutation BRCA2 gene mutation can easily be passed to the son or daughter with a 50 percent chance now if you have this gene mutation in females it increases your risk of breast cancer it increases your risk of ovarian cancer that's cancer of the ovaries and cancer of the pancreas that's in the female in the male it increases your risk of prostate cancer first then the risk of developing cancer of the pancreas and risk of developing cancer of the breast but in the female the, the most important or the most likely impact is on the breast. So that's why the breast came first, then ovarian cancer, then pancreatic cancer. Now, if you are found to have these, uh, any of these gene mutations, the thing you need to do is to have frequent screening. In other words, if somebody is screening probably 
every year. You'd want to probably be doing a screening every six months so that the likelihood of you know the the cancer that's the, probably will develop as a result of this it will be picked up very early for the males they would have to be doing frequent prostate cancer uh prostate cancer screening to check and also both male and female need to check their pancreas now how does this increase your chances well we, we have something we call the lifetime risk so as you remember in one of the previous slides i said one in eight so one in eight is about 13 percent so the 13% lifetime risk suddenly jumps to 87% likelihood of you developing breast cancer as a result of having this gene mutation. So rather moving from one in eight, you're moving for about from one in eight persons to four in five persons. It's actually even more than four, probably like 4.3 uh, over five out of five people. So the likelihood of you developing breast cancer suddenly increases by five. You are five times more likely to develop breast cancer than somebody who does not have the BRCA1 or BRCA2 uh, gene mutations. And at this point, let me let you know that this gene mutation can easily be tested for at Synlab here, at Synlab uh, offices. We can easily test for BRCA1, BRCA2 so that you can know if you have uh, these in, uh, gene mutations and therefore know whether your risk of developing breast cancer is increased. So for people who you have had a brother, a, a mother, perhaps a sister, an auntie, a niece having or developing breast cancer likely means that this gene mutation is existent within the family and therefore your chance of you having this mutation is very high. Okay, when you have a number of family relations probably having developed breast cancer, prostate cancer, and those things, it would be very advisable for you to check your BRCA1 and BRCA2 status. And in Synlab, we have a, a, what we call BRCA+. Plus. In other words, it looks at BRCA1, BRCA2, and about 16 other you know, gene mutations <clears throat> that, could be as a, that could lead or increase your chances of developing breast cancer. OK. So I think <clears throat> this is one of the most important slides and it is being able to identify those signs that would make, that would probably mean that you have or probably have a suspected breast cancer, okay? Now, for most women, what actually gets them to go to the hospital to check is when they feel a lump, okay? So the lump is the main or the primary you know, symptom or sign in suspecting breast cancer. So once you develop or you feel, you examine your breasts and you feel a lump, then it's something that would want, you'd want to actually have checked out. So sometimes this lump is detected on examining your breast yourself. In some cases, we've heard of partners who, you know, maybe fondling the breasts, discover that there's a lump here which he knows that he had never felt before. And usually they'll come and check and they'll find that indeed there is a lump. In some cases, it is cancerous. In some cases, it's not cancerous. Now, let me state that it's not all lumps that are cancerous. In, other, in, in actual fact, about 90% of the time, the lumps are not cancerous. And maybe just in 10% of the time, the lumps tend to be cancerous. So if you feel any lumps, do not panic. It's most likely not cancerous. And some women naturally have lumpy breasts. Their breasts are very lumpy, okay? So in such a case, it may be difficult for you to tell if it's, this is a new lump or whether this is something to be concerned about. But then if you have any concerns about any lumps in your breast, you can come over to any health facility, including Synlab Clinic. We can examine it and ensure that we let you know what it is. Another symptom is nipple discharge. So naturally, unless you are pregnant, you're not supposed to have any fluid coming from your breasts. So if you squeeze your breasts, or one day you take off your bra, you notice that the place is wet, then you're having nipple discharge, it's a cause for concern. And we would like to see you as medical practitioners to investigate further. But one of the symptoms or signs of breast cancer is nipple discharge. It could be clear, 
it could be creamy, it could be white, it could be bloody, it could be greenish, whatever it is, it is not expected and therefore it has to be further investigated. If you notice that you have you have a dimple within your breast, a dimple anywhere on your breast, it's also another suspected sign of breast cancer. Now, um, when you have a dimple, it usually means that there's a, likely a cancer underneath that is pulling on the tissues of your breast and results in a dimple. So any dimpling or a, a, a breach, not a breach, more like a change in the contour of your breast, you know, needs to be further investigated. Now, if you have any redness, any redness on the skin of your breast, at any point around the nipple, on the side, under the breast, once there's any redness, this could also be another suspected sign of breast cancer. Another key sign is what we call nipple retraction or nipple inversion. It means that the nipple is pulled in. So when you stand in the mirror and you look at your breasts, you realize that one breast has its nipple pointing out, which is the normal thing, and the other breast has the nipple pushed in. Again, you realize that probably this was not something you had before or you noticed before, but at this point, you realize that one nipple is gradually going in. This could also be due to an underlying tumor or cancer that is pulling on the nipple. And another feature, okay, which is what we call breast or nipple pain. Breast or nipple pain. And I intentionally did not talk about this even second. So I actually went down and came up to show you that if you have breast pain, it does not mean that you have cancer of the breast, okay? But even in most cases of which breast cancer has been diagnosed, 1% only complained of breast pain, okay? Only 1% complained of breast pain. So if you have breast pain, please don't panic. Don't be too worried. It's 99% likely that it's not breast cancer, all right? But nonetheless, it could also be a symptom or a sign of breast cancer. So if you do experience any pain and you're worried, kindly come, let's investigate further and make sure that everything is fine. They also have changes to the skin texture. You know that you have nice, smooth skin uh, of the breast, and later on you realize that the place is becoming funny, either becoming, developing rashes, or the place is appearing dry and a little scaly, or the, chi this, the, the, the skin is changing in its appearance and its texture. This could also be as a result of an underlying cancer. So if you see any of these, you should suspect that there's definitely something going wrong and we can investigate it further. Another thing is that if you notice a lump in your armpits, okay, usually, yes, quite a number of people develop boils in the armpits or maybe after shaving, you notice a lump in your armpits. Nonetheless, if you notice a lump, you don't want to take it for granted, okay? Usually these are lymph nodes within the armpits that become swollen as a result of uh, the cancer spreading to that aspect uh, of the of the armpit or to the lymph node in the armpit. So if you notice any swelling in your armpit, it could also be a sign or a symptom of breast cancer. Now, if you notice, you stand in the mirror and you realize that one breast is bigger than the other. There are some people who naturally have one breast bigger than the other, but that's not quite common. And but let's say you have noticed that, first of all, your breasts were both the same size. Suddenly you realize one is becoming bigger, one is becoming heavier, and this is out of the ordinary for you. It could be as a result of breast cancer, and indeed you want to have this checked out. So like I said, lumps, nipple discharge, dimpling of the breast, any breast pain, the nipple going in or retracting inward. If you notice any redness of the breast, if you notice any changes in the skin texture, and if you notice a swelling in your armpits or any swelling or enlargement of your breast being bigger than the other, you could likely have, or this, these could be signs of suspected breast cancer. And I keep saying suspected breast cancer because you can have any of these 
and you actually would actually investigate and it's not breast cancer. So these are things that you just, you know, pick your, 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 your awareness or like at least get you to react and come and have it checked out in case you, uh, you see any of these in or on your breasts. Now, these are images of breast cancer. I should say viewer discretion <laughs> is advised that this is a woman who has breast cancer. You'd notice that the skin texture has changed. It's appearing like the, the peel of an orange. You know, the, the way the orange looks like with a lot of dots all over. You can realize that it's also a little reddened around. You can also see that there's some yellowish discharge coming from the breast. So this straight away is a case of, of, of breast cancer. Okay, this is a case of breast cancer. Now we have this client here, if you can follow the, the my cursor, you realize that the nipple has pulled in. Generally around the breast, the breast looks really nice. It really looks okay. No major problem with the breast. But you realize that the only thing is that the, the nipple has been retracted or has been inverted inward, okay? And this is usually very strong, a strong indication of something going on behind the breast or within the breast, which is pulling on uh, the nipple. In the image below, we, if you can see clearly, you realize that there's a dimpling, a dimple within the skin. There's a dimple within the skin. And if you look closely again, you can see it's as if there's a, a mass in this region, there's a mass in this area. So this is a lump beneath, within the breast, which is pulling on the tissues of the skin, resulting in a dimpling. In the next image here, you realize we have a breast, it looks maybe normal, but you realize it has, again, like I mentioned here, the appearance of an orange skin, or the skin of an orange, with these visible dots all over. The, the nipple appears to be retracting a little, but anytime you have this kind of thing, this is very much likely to be a cancer, you know? So the appearance, this appearance is called peau d'orange, peau d'orange, because it looks like an orange, peau d'orange, and it's usually related to cancers of the breast. Now, this is a case of a client who has an ulceration of the breast in the region of the nipple. Such a person, usually, they would have stayed at home for too long, either doing herbal medications, going to perhaps a prayer camp, or doing so many sorts of things that by the time they come to the hospital, they have this ulceration. Now, this is the best picture of an ulceration that I've brought to us. I mean, there are worse ones than, than what I'm showing. And in such a case, these uh, this is a case of usually an advanced cancer. Now, all this, this particular image, this image, this image, this and that, are all cases of advanced cancer. You see, because once the, the breast, the cancer begins to give you problems and you come, it's most likely advanced, okay? But when we pick it up on perhaps a routine screening, the, the chances are that it's really not advanced. But that's neither the case because there are other, also cancers that can develop within and be at a late stage but then you don't have any of these appearances. You don't have any of, any of these appearances. So it's very important, however, to be able to pick up the cancer before it causes problems. Now, what is it about breast cancer that makes it a huge problem? Straight away, we know that breast cancer leads to, when you, if you have breast cancer, it's not detected early, and perhaps it's not, in manage, it's not managed effectively, it can lead to death. And that's what we want to prevent. And the thing about breast cancer is that it can get to a point where it metastasizes, what we call metastatic breast cancer. In other words, the cancer spreads, okay? And the common places breast cancer spreads to are uh, to the brain, it spreads to the lungs, and it can also spread to the liver. And finally, it spreads to the bones. And when breast cancer spreads, in truth, at that point, management becomes very difficult. At that point, we're just looking to buy as much time for the individual. But once cancer has spread to your brain, to your lungs, to your liver, or to your bones, there's no chance of cure. Or should I say the chance of cure is, is negligible, all right? So 
it is very important that we are able to pick up the cancer before it spreads. And with that, we have a great opportunity at uh, possibly achieving uh, some level of cure. Okay. Now, how do we diagnose breast cancer? How do we get to make sure that what you've felt in your breast or whether, first of all, whether you possibly have anything in your breast and what you felt in your breast, whether that could be uh, breast cancer. So first thing I'd like to mention is that early detection is very important, you know, if you are to have the best treatment outcomes. And obviously the best treatment outcome we're looking for is survival, you know, that if you do have breast cancer, you surviving and overcoming the disease. Now there are physical methods for diagnosing breast cancer. First of all, it starts by self-breast examinations. Where you, the individual, you examine your breasts periodically to ensure that there's nothing there. Then the next aspect is letting a doctor or a nurse or anybody trained, you know, clinical person trained to examine your breasts, okay? So when the doctor examines your breast or the nurse, that's why we call the clinical breast examination. So usually it's when you identify a breast lump, then you'd like to have a doctor also examine to make sure that it is possibly not your own lumpy breast that you're feeling, okay? So that's why the doctor or the clinical breast examination comes in. Now we have other diagnostic tools that we use. We have the breast ultrasound, we have the mammogram, and we have the MRI. And we also have what we call breast biopsy. Now these are other diagnostic tools. I'd like to even say that the breast biopsy is more of a confirmatory tool of what is suspected. So we'll take our time and go through all these uh, modalities. So in performing self-breast examination, the whole point is that you want to be able to look at your breasts and you want to feel your breasts. And you want to do this regularly so that you begin to know what is the normal you know, consistency of your breast. Do you have uh, very firm breasts? Do you have lumpy breasts? Uh, you get to know how your breasts feel all through. Okay, and the thing is that the day you find something out of the normal, that is what would give you an indication that probably there's something going on wrong. So the self-breast examination is to just be able to look at your breast, feel your breast regularly, so that you know the normal and you are able to identify any abnormal feeling within your breast. Now, it's advised that you perform this monthly. Every month, at least once every month, you should perform your self-breast examination. Um, for those women who are menstruating, it's preferable at least uh, a few days after your menses. So within the first week of your menstruate, after your menstruation, you can always make sure that you periodically examine your breasts. Now, for women who are menopausal, those who have stopped menstruating, you are to choose a fixed day of every month, a fixed day of every month to check your breasts and ensure that everything is normal. Now, it's advised that you can do this while lying down. So probably before you wake up from bed, you quickly do your examination, left breast, right breast, and just check. You can also do that while you're bathing. And it's usually good with bathing because the soap makes it easier to be able to feel all over uh, your breast. Okay. And again, when you are dressing up in front of your mirror, so you can stand in front of the mirror, have a good visual of your breast to see if one is bigger than the other, to compare the nipples, to look and see if there are any skin changes around the breast. And uh, so you can also do this in front of the mirror. So that's also another way to do it. So either lying in bed while bathing or standing in front of the mirror when you're dressing up. <clears throat> I'd like to play this short video. It's just a minute. And this video would help, you know, uh, those of us on the presentation to know how to carry out an effective and a very correct uh, self-breast examination. So kindly pay attention and let's listen to this. Checking your breasts regularly helps you know what's normal for you. Choose a time and place to check your breasts that suits you.
Sorry, let me play this again. I got information that to check the people are not hearing it, so I'll take it again. Checking your breasts regularly helps you know what's normal. <coughs> time and place to check your breasts when it suits you. Begin by looking at your breasts in the mirror. Keep your shoulders straight and put your hands on your hips. Look at each breast and nipple to check for any changes in size or shape. This includes whether your nipple has sunken or become inverted, or if there's any fluid coming from one or both nipples. Check your skin for any redness, rashes, dimpling or puckering. Now raise your arms and look for the same changes. Next, feel for any lumps or painful areas. Use the flat part of your fingers to gently work around each breast, pressing in small circular motions. Vary your pressure to check the tissue just under your skin, but also deeper tissue too. <clears throat> Be sure to check the whole of your breast area. This includes under your armpits, all around each breast and up to your collarbone. Do this step laying down, perhaps in bed, and then standing up, maybe while taking a shower. Your breasts might feel different at different times during the month. So getting to know what's normal for you is key. Always contact your GP if you notice any unusual changes. Okay, so the majority of breast lumps have actually been found during self-breast examination. And obviously, at the, num the majority of breast cancers have been determined through self-breast examination. So it really underscores the importance of regularly checking your breasts to ensure that if there's anything abnormal, it is picked up early. Okay. And the next mode of investigation is what we call breast ultrasound. I'm sure a lot of women have done breast ultrasound either for pregnancy or and even the males for maybe any abdominal checks. Those who do routine uh, health checks would actually have had a breast have, would have had an, a, an ultrasound, either an abdominal ultrasound or any other ultrasound for that matter. But breast ultrasound is usually prescribed for women who are less than 40. Okay, women who are less than 40. And uh, the reason we prescribe breast ultrasound is that women who are less than 40, uh, especially women who have not had children, they have dense breasts, dense breasts. And because of the density of their breasts, we realize that uh, ultrasound is able to see much better than, you know, those who have less dense breasts. So in older women, older women have fatty breasts and breast ultrasound, though effective, is not usually the most prescribed option, okay? Now, breast ultrasound is able to identify those normal or suspicious breast masses, those normal or suspicious breast masses. And uh, the good thing about breast ultrasound is that it uses sound waves, it uses sound waves which are you know not harmful to the to the body most people complain about radiations and they think that they believe that these radiations can actually lead to uh, cancer but for ultrasound it makes use of sound waves now <clears throat> for those women like i was saying women who are above 40 uh usually it's very good to combine breast ultrasound with the mammogram this all helps to give more characterization to any uh, mass that is seen or perhaps even be able to determine that, okay, fine, the breast is normal because you've combined two very good modalities to investigate the breast. Now, the image here just depicts or shows what um, a breast ultrasound procedure looks like. So we have this machine in the background, which is called the ultrasound machine, and the machine is connected to a probe so the probe is placed over the breast with a gel on the breast, rub 
to every aspect of the breast. So in scanning, we go in a clockwise direction. So from the one o'clock region, two o'clock region, three o'clock region, all the way to the 12 o'clock region. Then we extend the scanning into the armpits of the individual to make sure that we look that we we'll look at the lymph nodes and <clears throat> sorry and part of the breast actually extends to the armpits so we don't just scan the breast that we all see but we extend the scanning into the piece of the breast tissue that extends into the armpit now i've got three images here okay so this is an image of a normal breast tissue we have the area of the skin we have the area of the fatty tissue, then we have the area of the glandular, or what we call the fibrous and glandular tissue of the breast. Now, within the breast of the, the next image, we see a well-defined uh, dark lesion, a well-defined lesion, okay, or a, a well-defined mass. And it looks purely black. It doesn't have any things within it. And in such a case, we have a, a lesion or a mass that is not cancerous. The non-cancerous lesions, uh, you know, have a very well uh, defined outline and the appearance within is very clean, okay? And even when you look around the lesion, you realize that there's really what we call no architectural distortion. In other words, the tissues around the lesion still look fine and look normal. Now, in the next, the last image here, you realize that this lesion is not well defined. You cannot see the edges here too well. You can you realize that there's a dimpling or an, an, an angulation at this point. The lesion itself has black, has white, has gray, different colors, okay? And if you notice, like I said, in this area, there's some distortion of the surrounding uh, tissues. So this, when we see this, we strongly suspect a, a cancerous uh, mass in the breast. So this is what breast ultrasound does. It helps us to be able to easily tell whether this is very suspicious or if this is normal. And ultrasound also helps grade the likelihood of what we're seeing as to whether it is less likely to be uh, malignant or cancerous or more likely to be a normal lesion. We also have mammograms. I'm sure we've all heard mammo, mammo. So the full meaning is actually mammogram. Now, mammograms make use of low dose x-rays, low dose x-rays. In other words, the, the quantity of this x-ray that you're receiving is very unlikely to cause cancer. So a woman would come and say that, oh, she's done mammogram already. Why should she do it maybe again in the same year? Isn't it going to predispose or cause her to have cancer? The thing is that mammograms are specially designed to give low dose x-rays and yet quality images. Now, we usually recommend mammograms for women who are 40 years and above. So once you're 40 and above, you must be doing mammograms. Yes, we can combine the mammogram with ultrasound, but you would not do just the ultrasound alone, but you must have a mammogram in addition. Now, in people who cross 40 years, uh, the breasts begin to change from being uh, a dense breast to being a fatty breast, okay? From being a dense breast to being a fatty breast. And if your breasts are dense and you do a mammogram, it will just appear very white. And anytime there's a cancer, the cancer usually appears as white. So in a dense breast on a mammogram, the cancer can easily hide within the tissues and will not see anything. So usually, because the breasts are usually fatty after the after 40 years old, it begins to become fatty. The mammogram is able to pick out the cancer much clearly than you know in a dense breast. And uh, this is an image that shows uh, a woman undergoing a mammogram procedure. So you have two plates: the lower plate and the upper plate. And the breast is placed within the plate and the plate is used to sort of press gently on the breast and then an, an x-ray image of the breast is taken. So this here is, is the image of uh, the breast on mammogram. So we have this breast in the, the, this image in the breast in its standing position. And we have this image here, more like what we see in the picture. 
uh, of the, the woman taking the procedure. This is how it would appear in this image. All right. So in going back to the anatomy, what we see here as the black part is the skin and the fatty tissue. And then within it, the white part is the structures of the breast. So this looks very uniform and it shows that clearly there is no cancer within the breast. So mammograms are quite effective. They have about 85 to 95, 95% accuracy in being able to pick out anything that is perhaps abnormal within the breast. So it's advised that women above 40, you do mammograms and it's also advisable to combine it with uh, ultrasounds of the breast. Now, breast biopsy. So in this image here, we have a very nice fatty breast, very uniform, but we have this white structure here, which is very different from the rest of the breast. In such an, uh, an instance, we strongly suspect it could be uh, a cancerous thing because like I mentioned, the edges are very irregular and you realize that there's a little distortion of the tissues around it, okay? And in such a case, uh, as a radiologist, your first suspicion is a cancerous uh, tumor, okay? Now, we need to be very sure, though this is very highly suspicious of a cancer, we need to be very sure, and that's where we come to do a breast biopsy. So a breast biopsy just simply means taking a piece of the tumor to go and have it tested. So most times when we do our biopsy, we do it under ultrasound. So this is the ultrasound probe here. We have our needle uh, and we locate the, 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 the lump or the mass using the ultrasound. Then we push the needle straight into it and take a piece of it, okay? So usually we have fine needle, fine needle aspiration or core aspiration, which is just very much like this, where we enter the breast and take a piece of it for them to go and test and see if indeed whether it's a cancer or not. If the lump is small, uh, we may rather choose to want to go inside and do an excision. So in this second picture B, you see that they've done a surgery, they've located the, the, the lump and they've taken the lump totally out, okay? And when they do this, we now take the whole lump and go and check to see if it is a cancerous lump or if it is uh, a benign lump, there's no cancer. Now in the other image A, what we do here is that if the mass or the tumor is very big, such that at the point where we are still investigating, we cannot take out the whole thing. We just go inside, make an incision and take a piece of the lump and take it and go and have it tested. So the biopsy could either be using a needle to take a piece of the lump we could also be taking just a piece of the lump by doing a surgery and just cutting up a piece of it or taking out the whole lump and taking it to the to the laboratory yeah. for testing so that's breast biopsy now in the treatment or before we treat a cancer we usually would like to stage it so we've done uh, a breast ultrasound we've done a mammogram we've done a biopsy okay now with all these three things plus a few other investigations, we need to be able to do what stage the cancer. I'm sure we've all heard, oh, she had cancer was stage four, her cancer was stage uh, three, stage two. Now, the purpose of staging the cancer determines how far the, the disease has progressed, okay? So if you are in stage four, that means your cancer has progressed to the fully advanced stage. If you're in stage one, stage two, that means you're sort of like in the early stages of uh, the breast cancer. And all these influence the kind of treatment you will receive, okay? And again, it also determines the kind of outcome of your treatments, whether you'd have, uh, you'd be cured or whether you have five more years to go or whether your doctor will tell you that, listen, anything can happen between now and three months or now and six months. So staging is very important. We need to know the stage of the cancer so they can advise us as to the kind of treatments and the kind of outcome that we're expecting. So stage one, we usually have the presence of the abnormal cells, but it has not spread anywhere. It hasn't even, it hasn't even spread to the tissues nearby, okay? Now in the early stage, stage one, 
So we have stage zero. It hasn't spread, but it's the cancer is there. Stage one, the cancer has spread only to the tissues nearby. It hasn't gone to distant tissues yet. In stage two, you find that the tumor has become a little bigger, you know, about two centimeters to five centimeters. And there are a few lymph nodes, like if you remember the image of the lymph, lymph nodes, a few lymph nodes that are involved, okay? Or either that we just have one big tumor and no lymph nodes that are involved. Then we have what we call regional spread. So we have a tumor which is now about five centimeters or bigger. And there's more lymph nodes that are involved in a wider region. Okay, that's what we call regional spread. That means it's moved from stage two, stage three, they spread, but the spread is very, very regional. It's within the region of the breast. And then we have stage four, which is distant spread. That means the cancer has spread beyond the breast. So this is where it spreads to the liver, the lungs, or the brain, or the bones, or any other parts of the body. Okay, so depending on whether you're stage zero, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, that determines uh, a whole lot about your management and the likely outcome of your of the breast cancer. Our best bet is that we always want to have, perhaps it's within stage zero, stage one, at worst stage two. When it's stage three, stage four, it makes treatment more, more aggressive and you know uh, much more challenging for the for the team. So finally, as we round off, we are looking at breast cancer treatment. Breast cancer treatment. What are the options that are available to successfully and effectively uh, treat breast cancer? You know, so beyond just the early the, the early identification of breast cancer, another key thing is effective treatment. Okay. Now the choice of treatment depends on one the stage, like I mentioned, and also depends on the type of cancer. We learned the stages we've already also learned about the types of breast cancer. And again, it depends on the individual's overall health. If we find a woman who's 80 years old uh, and she's developed breast cancer, her treatments would be different from maybe a, a young, maybe 50 year old person or maybe 40 year old person who has breast cancer. You know, the 80 year old may not survive the surgery, but maybe the younger person would have would be able to survive the surgery and have a good prognosis after after that. And also the preferences. Um, a young lady who probably has just gotten married and now she has breast cancer, you're saying that you're going to take off the whole breast. You know, would probably say that no, maybe let's be a little conservative. Let's try and take out the, 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 the cancer mass itself and let's see how it goes. As compared to somebody who's probably 60, 70, who, you know, has no need to, as it were, function for the breast, no purposes, may choose that, oh no, take off the breast. So indeed there's the aspect of individual preferences. And in the process of treatment, it's con it's conducted by a multidisciplinary team of healthcare professionals. So we have the oncologists who are the specialists who treat cancer. We have the surgeons, those who would actually do the surgery to take the cancer out. We have radiation oncologists. These are people who use radiation or like use strong x-rays to you know kill the cancers we have the pathologists those who when you take a biopsy you go and give it to the pathologist they will look into it and tell you that this is a cancer or this is not a cancer or if it is a cancer it's this type of cancer or that type of cancer and one key role is the role of psychologists because when somebody is diagnosed to have breast cancer it's very traumatizing at that point your whole world is collapsing. You feel your whole world is collapsing. You don't know what to do. And you really need to, you know, get to the point where you can begin to take decisions as to the kind of treatment you're going to have and begin to put things in, in you know, in perspective. So psychologists play a very key role in the process of breast cancer management. Now, the options that are available include surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and there are other forms of therapy called hormone therapy or immunotherapy. There's a tall list of other surgeries, uh, other treatment modalities, but these are the key ones and the common ones that you would naturally come across. Now, in surgery, there's something we call lumpectomy. Lumpectomy. Lump is what we know, lump, and ectomy means removal, so removal of the lump. So lumpectomy involves removing the tumor 
and a small amount of surrounding healthy tissue. So this, you do that to ensure that you've taken the tumor and you even take more, a little bit of the surrounding normal tissue to ensure that there's no trace of a cancer cell that is left behind. So the whole, this process is done to leave or preserve the rest of the tumor. And we only do this for those early stage breast cancers. So if the cancer is in stage zero, stage one, perhaps stage two, then actually stage zero and one, then you'd want to just take out the lump and a bit of the healthy tissue out of it. So this images here shows that an incision is made, the lump is taken out and the incision is closed. So this is very much as, as what you see. And it's only done for those cancers that are in the early stage of its diagnosis. Then we have mastectomy, mastectomy. So under mastectomy, we have total mastectomy where we remove the entire breast. Then we have what we call modified radical mastectomy. Modified radical mastectomy. That's, we remove the entire breast. And if you remember the lymph nodes, we also remove all the nearby lymph nodes. So all the lymph nodes that are near the, the tumor, we remove it. And we have one th what we call radical mastectomy. Now, we try not to perform this. We do our best not to get to this stage where we have to perform radical mastectomy, but it involves removing the entire breast. Now, we also remove the muscles of the chest that are behind the breast. We remove all of it. And we also remove the lymph nodes in that area. So it's really an extensive surgery, you know, that we do. And we do this for those aggressive uh, uh, cancers that are identified at a late stage, and we do not want to probably leave anything to chance. So we do a radical mastectomy, but these are rarely performed uh, these days. So this is an image of a woman who has had a mastectomy. The entire breast is removed, and uh, it's you know uh, one of the treatment modalities to handle more advanced uh, breast cancer cases. Now, radiation therapy, which is available in Ghana and done in Ghana with good results is where you have a person lie down then at the radiation or the x-ray beam. So it uses high energy x-ray beams to target and destroy the cancer cells. So cancer within the breast or in the, the affected breast is, uh, is targeted with these high energy x-rays. And usually they do this over a period with the purposes of destroying the cancer cells. You know, if the cancer is detected at an early stage, there are very good chances of being able to, uh, you know, destroy and kill those cells. Right. So, um, so we also prescribe this after you've removed the lump, and also when you've had a mastectomy, radiation therapy can be done. And finally, we have chemotherapy. So chemotherapy just involves giving more like an infusion of of certain drugs that are used to either kill the cancer cells or to slow the growth of the cancer cells okay and we usually use chemotherapy especially when the cancer has spread to other parts of the body and sometimes we can also use chemotherapy to be able to shrink the the cancer or the mass before it begins to spread to other places so this is chemotherapy so there's an image of a person receiving chemotherapy and it's exactly how it's done in our hospitals and as a roundoff we'll just look at a few things okay that how can we prevent getting breast cancer there is no specific thing that we can do to prevent getting cancer but there are indeed a number of things that we can do to reduce our chances of getting breast cancer one is to maintain a healthy weight okay so if you know that you're overweight you're obese you would like to be able to exercise at least 30 minutes every day in order to maintain a healthy weight. You advise to eat balanced diets, that foods that contain fruits, vegetables, whole grain, and lean protein. If you take alcohol, you advise to reduce or limit the amount of alcohol consumption. Uh, if you smoke, you advise to stop smoking uh, because every amount of smoking can predispose you to a cancer. Breastfeeding is a good thing. So women who have children, some feel that they don't want to disfigure their breast, so they only breastfeed for like three months. You know, but it's advised to breastfeed for, to about two years, which helps, you know, reduce your likelihood of developing breast cancer in the future. And if you have any uh, history of 
what do you call it, any of the genetic mutations, it's good to have genetic counseling so that you know what to do. It's very important to conduct cell breast uh, examinations every month and also to do regular screening using ultrasound and mammogram. These are very important. And the key facts we all should take home are that all females are at risk of breast cancer, including males, but females more, that it is the most common cancer and the leading cause of cancer death amongst women in Ghana. So breast cancer is the leading cause of death, you know, amongst women in Ghana. And about 50% unfortunately die because they come in the late stage. Now, breast screening is the best way to be able to detect cancer in its early stage. And if detected early with effective treatments, you have a very high chance of achieving cure. So I advice to you is to seek treatment very early, okay? And I close with just these few myths, okay? Uh, a lot of people have been hearing so many things about breast cancer and it's affected them in responding and doing the right things about breast cancer and sometimes even creating fear. So the first myth is finding a lump in your breast means you have breast cancer. So it is not all lumps that are cancerous lumps. As a matter of fact, it's only about 10% that you'd actually find to be a cancer and the many 90% are not. A mammogram can cause breast cancer and spread it. So mammograms use very low dose x-rays and these are very unlikely to cause breast cancer and definitely also does not spread uh, the breast cancer. Some people also think that antiperspirants and deodorants cause breast cancer. Antiperspirants and deodorants cause breast cancer. This is not true. There's no evidence to show that antiperspirants or deodorants can cause breast cancer or any other cancer for that matter. Breast cancer is more common in women with bigger breasts. So people have attributed bigger breasts to uh, the likelihood of developing breast cancer, but there isn't, but bigger breasts, small breasts, they all have uh, the same risk of, of breast cancer. But it is noted that being able to investigate or examine bigger breasts is usually more difficult, you know, when you're examining them or investigating them for breast cancer. But the fact that you have anybody has bigger breasts does not increase the risk of getting breast cancer. Now, breast pain is a definitive diagnosis of breast cancer. Like I said, it's only 1% of people who have had breast cancer actually complain of breast pain. Now, carrying a phone in your bra can cause breast cancer. People are worried that if they carry their phone around their pocket area or within their bra, as some people, some women do, can cause breast cancer. But there's no um, research finding that has been able to link even the, the phone wave signals to any cancer for that matter. So carrying a phone anywhere near your breast or your chest does not increase your risk of developing breast cancer. Now, bras with underwire cause breast cancer. Um, most Some bras have a wire underneath, and it's been thought that uh, such bras can cause breast cancer. There is no association of the breast underwire or any type of bra for that matter that can actually lead to breast cancer. So this is also a myth. There are so many myths uh, around um, breast cancer and so many other things, but at least these are things that we have to be able to investigate and, 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 and look into. For instance, I'm sure somebody will ask me later on whether sucking of breasts can actually uh, prevent breast cancer. So I'll leave it for somebody to ask and I'll answer it later on within the presentation. So thank you so much for being a part of the presentation. At this point, we'd like to take any questions that you may have. After asking your questions, I also have two questions for you. And if you're able to get these two questions, uh, Synlab has a surprise for you. Thank you very much. So if you have any questions on the presentation or anything around breast cancer, I'd more than be happy to answer these questions for you. Yes, we have somebody's hand up. Gar Kenke Guy, can you proceed? Go 
Gakenke guy. I'm sorry, I was mute. So my question is, um, we always see these videos on how to do the examination, but it's always for the female person. We don't have that much flesh there, so how do we also do examinations um, as men? Right. Um, indeed, this, it's, it's no different from what we've already been seeing. As a matter of fact, uh, it's even easier for us men to examine our breasts because our breasts are quite flat and are quite close to our chest wall. So um, it's the same procedure like women either can do it in the bathroom where you have a lot of soap uh, on, to en enable the hand to move smoothly. And it's in the same met method using the, the sort of the ball of your fingers and rubbing in a circular motion right from let's say the 12 o'clock position and in a round uh, format and again into the armpit. So it's very much the same procedure, although we focus on women because women are more at risk. Uh, it's the same process that we employ for men to also carry out to examine their breasts. Thank you. Thank you. We have love Yamate. Kindly proceed with your question. Love yeah, hello. Good evening. Yes, Doc, can you? Doc, please. Good evening. Please, can you hear me? I can hear you, thank you. Love you, I can hear you. Hello. Hello, I can, I can hear you, love you. Can, can you speak? Oh, okay. Doc, please, mine has to do with, uh, for some time now, my breast itches a lot. I've gone to do They did not find any lump in it. There's no discharge. It itches. The skin itches a lot, and there are rashes around. Anytime I scratch, there are rashes around it. Please, is it also a sign or something related to breast cancer? Okay. So, Lovia, like you said, you've done a lot of tests. Uh, you've, I'm sure you've done a scan. You correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe perhaps you've also done your mammogram, and they haven't seen anything. So once you've done your scan, you've done your mammogram, and they haven't seen anything, then it is definitely uh, clear that you don't have breast cancer. So what I explain is that you can have some of these uh, signs, but then you don't have breast cancer. So in this case, what I suspect is that you just have a normal, in quotes, dermatology problem. So the person you have to be seeing is now at this point, not any breast cancer kind of doctor, but you should be seeing a dermatologist, you know, who would investigate what the cause of the skin irritation you're experiencing is. Okay, and I can assure you that you go and check and it's something that is easily treatable that's with uh, maybe a few weeks of treatment, you have your resolution. But I think the key thing is that once you have any of these things on your breast, at least let the worst of it be, be, be taken out of the list, which is quickly just go and check, could what I'm experiencing be due to breast cancer? So you go and do your ultrasound, you go and do your mammogram, then when the doctor says, oh, everything is clean, then you can now step down to go and look at the dermatologist to see if in case it's some skin infection or that that is going on so it does not mean that you have breast cancer while you as long as you've done the necessary investigations for breast cancer and everything has come out negative it means that you're okay so i just advise that do well to see a skin doctor so that they can look at the rash and the itchiness and give you appropriate medication okay thank you very much yeah, you're most welcome love you thank you Um, Jay Kenny, you can proceed with the Yes, um, Doc, um, you have this catchy phrase, suck a breast, save a life. I mean, is this, is this sucking the breast, which is um, detecting anything? Or... Yes, so uh, suck a breast, save a life. Truly. I guess was probably trying to have men more 
uh, you know, proactive about you know examining their wife's first. Okay, because we needed. I'm sure it came out because men. It, was, it needed men to be more involved in the in the health of their wives and their partners by examining their breasts. But as to whether sucking of breasts actually prevents uh, breast cancer, or should I be putting this as to whether male partners sucking the breasts of their 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 wives and their partners preventing breast cancer? It does not. Okay, it does not. Okay, so usually. When we say uh, sucking of breasts, we're actually referring to breastfeeding, okay? So if we have a baby breastfeeding for, let's say, two years, okay, that is the recommended period, it does, you know, confer some amount of protection against breast cancer, okay? So women who, feed, who breastfeed for long periods have uh, a greater uh, protection as it were, against breast cancer than somebody who either has never breastfed before. So I think it is in the thought of uh, breastfeeding that the men who trying to find a place in all that came out with saying that, let's say, sucking of the breast does perhaps, you know, protect against breast cancer, but it doesn't. It's only breastfeeding by the, the, the baby during, you know, the breastfeeding period that confers some protection against breast cancer, but not the regular sucking of the breast by the, the the partner outside you know the period of of breastfeeding so it is usually just mainly to have the man involved you know in you know examining the breast and being a participant in ensuring that the wife's breasts are are safe from uh, any breast cancer or any lumps i hope that helps I, I know some men are disappointed, but it, it doesn't matter. Sometimes during the process of sucking, you can find something which can be quite, you know, uh, timely. Because indeed, some cases of reported uh, lumps and unfortunately maybe breast cancers were actually found by the partner who, you know, you know, realized that this thing was never felt before. So let's investigate it. So yes um at least there's a role in terms of finding something <laughs> thank you very much um doc i think there's one question in the chat box for you okay um can that ecstasia develop into breast cancer <laughs> so um for those who don't know what ductectasia is, ductectasia refers to the dilatation or the enlargement of the ducts, okay? So in its uh, sense, ductectasia does not necessarily mean or lead to breast cancer, no, okay? But then indeed, uh, there can be cancers that develop within the ducts that result in the dilatation or the enlargement of the duct, okay? And so you'd report radiologically as maybe dilated ducts but if you look very well you sometimes may find the cancer developing within the duct resulting in the the dilatation or the expansion of the duct so indeed you have to find out the underlying cause of the ductic taste or the duct dilatation for which uh, a cancer could be one of those causes of ductic taste here. thank you very much Do, do we have any more questions? I've got my two questions ready for the prizes. Yes, we have um, someone here, Francis a Champo. Okay. Francis, go on. Okay, I think... Can we have an idea? Okay, so while we wait for Francis, there's another one in the... Charles, that says, can we have an idea of the cost of the common exams? Um, and does health insurance cover treatment? So, okay. So, for instance, um, it really depends on where you, you do your examinations, okay? So, in terms of an ultrasound, an ultrasound is about 250 Ghana cities. 300, mm -hmm. 200, 250, 300 Three. Ghana cities, yeah. Yes. 
uh, and then um, a mammogram, again, depending on where you go, ranges from, again, about 400 to 600 Ghana cities, okay? So, averagely, but usually during the period of, uh, you know, October, Senlab and, again, other uh, organizations do discounts or promotions to, to further drop these prices. But then on the regular, these are the ballpark figures in terms of prices, yeah. But then when it comes to the clinical breast examinations, where you come to see uh, myself or any of my team or any doctor elsewhere do a clinical breast examination, these are things that we do for free, you know. So in case you come, you feel, you do your self-breast examination, you see something you're worried about, you come to a facility, we'd also do the examination to be able to determine that, yes, indeed, this is something to be worried about or not to be worried about. And... Um, if we see something that we feel we should investigate further, then we'll recommend the ultrasound or the, the mammogram, depending on your age, uh, for further investigation. Okay. And the second part that says, do we accept um, or health insurance treatment? Does it cover? Yes, it does. We do accept all health insurance yes, and yes, it covers these things. There's another question here. Does a swollen okay. armpit or could a swollen armpit be a sign of breast cancer? I need clarity on that part, please. Okay. So a swollen armpit truly could be as a result of a number of conditions. So indeed, if you have a boil, all right, and you know how a boil looks like, it's very enlarged, it's painful, it is reddened. Uh, sometimes the boil in your armpit is discharging, then it is very much unlikely to be due to breast cancer, all right? The thing about cancer is that if even if there's a boil or like a swelling in your armpit and it is painless, it doesn't have, usually cancer doesn't cause pain, <laughs> you know, when you just discover it. But so if it's something that is causing pain at that point, it's unlikely to be. So if the pain attracted you to the, the swelling, then it's unlikely to be due to cancer, breast cancer. So indeed, it depends on the, the the kind of swelling, but if it's a swelling that you come across, you know, coincidentally, you know, without it necessarily being a due to pain that attracted it, you to, you know, notice that swelling there, then indeed, like I said, uh, a swelling or a lump in your armpits could be a, what do you call it, an indication of breast cancer. So nonetheless, I'd still say that whatever you find within your breast, around your breast, in your armpits, that is uh, a cause of worry. At least the most important thing you would want to be able to, uh, you know, rule out is a cancer. So if you see any of such thing, at least the first step would be to just see a doctor and let us look at it ourselves, let us examine it ourselves. And then if it is nothing to worry about, we'll tell you that it's not, nothing to worry about, probably put you on some medications to treat it. Or if we feel that we need further investigations, then we'll now recommend that, okay, let's do an ultrasound. Maybe after the ultrasound, let's move further to do a mammogram. Okay. So in most cases, it depends really what kind of lump is there or what kind of swelling is there. And a few more details of how, when did the swelling come or when did you notice it? And whether you notice it small and has it increased over the period of, over a period of time. All these kinds of information will be able to tell whether you should be worried about it being a cancer or not. Okay, so we have a few more questions, but we have a hand here, so we'll take that and I'll read the question after okay. that. Edith Chandoff, you can go ahead with your question, please. Edith. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to commend you guys. This is actually very informative, so thank you for that. Um, awesome. Thank you. I just want to know, are there instances where there are like silent symptoms so you don't have any symptoms at all but then you could have breast cancer uh either thank you so much for your question and i'd say a big 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 emphatic yes okay and i say this because um i actually personally know somebody who had no symptoms whatsoever and only just checked her breast examined her breast because she just noticed that somebody she knew being diagnosed of uh, breast cancer around the same same age as her. So she then decides, okay, let me just quickly check my breast and see, and indeed notice there's a lump. And 
very then the very next day went to check and was found to be stage four stage four which is the last stage <laughs> stage four breast cancer this person had no swollen breast no breast tenderness uh, at least there was a lump but hadn't felt the lump you know um you know so there was no skin changes to probably get the person to like get worried so yes indeed you can actually have breast cancer and even stage four without having any symptoms so by the time she would have developed symptoms it would have been late in other words it would have probably spread to uh, other parts of the body and a whole lot of other things so yes to, uh, the answer to your question is a big yes thank you yeah and i think that's to re-emphasize the need that we should constantly always be checking the annual checks the monthly uh, self breast examinations and if you have a family history of breast cancer it means that you probably have to do it more frequently than any other person so perhaps every six months you know because you probably have a gene mutation that increases your likelihood of developing breast cancer by five times compared to the person who doesn't have the gene mutation. Thank you. And before I read the, the question in the chat, Frank, Francis Champong, is your hand still up or if not, okay. All right, so doc, doc um, in the case where a man in my family has prostate cancer, Mm -hmm. Would that increase my risk of developing breast cancer? And could that possibly mean the gene mutation exists in my family? Okay, um, I think this is from Enyonam, right? So Enyonam, um, since we're talking chances and probabilities, so if the person in your family who had prostate cancer actually has the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation, okay? Now, if the person, for instance, is your father, you know, there's a 50% chance that that gene mutation was passed to you, okay? So this is all in chances. So people can have, or like men can have prostate cancer, and it's not because of a gene mutation, okay? Or it's not because of that BRCA gene mutation. But in the case that it is, it means that there's a 50% chance that this uh, gene mutation has also been passed on to the children, you know, or, or let's say the man's children. And therefore, if it is the case, it means there's a risk, there's a high risk that you could also be, or the person could also be at risk of developing breast cancer. So the thing is that because your the man or the parents, the, the male did not check to see if he has the gene mutation, you also would be not too sure if you also have the gene mutation. So it's to say that either that you check to see if you have the gene mutation or not, or you perhaps decide to have regular screenings. That means every six months you check, every six months you check, and you are very religious, therefore, with also the self-breast examinations. So that as soon as you pick out anything out of the ordinary, you are doing a full checkup to investigate for, for anything, uh, to make sure that there's no cancer uh, in the background. So yes, if you have a family history of prostate cancer, especially in one or two or three uh, male relations, you should, uh, probably do a BRCA a gene mutation test, you know, because that could be an indication that there is a gene mutation that's going through the family. Thank you, Nyonam. Doc, just to add on to the BRCA test, um, I would just like to state that it's uh, quite pricey, but we are very open to a credit arrangement. So you can always call our contact center. We will then get in touch with you and arrange, you know, for a payment plan that's suitable to you. Um, the other question is, a woman breastfeeding a child has a lump suspected to be a cancer. Is it advisable for her to continue with breastfeeding? And does it pose a higher risk to the child being um, breastfed if it's cancerous? That's a very interesting question. So um, a woman breastfeeding a child has a lump suspected to be a cancer. Is it advisable for her to continue with the breastfeeding? Uh, and if it does, and does it pose a higher risk to the child being breastfed if it is cancerous? So one, it does not pose any risk to the child that is being breastfed. And if, um, you know, so the thing is that if one breast is cancerous, we usually would advise that you just breastfeed on the, with the other breast. 
and it's not like there's it's not like that there can be a transference of the gene the the cancerous cells to the baby and therefore lead to cancer no so there's no transmission in that sense and i would just rather advise that you breastfeed with the other breast that is okay um basically that but in the case obviously that's if the mother is in quite a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort they would advise that the mother goes to using formula feeding to you know to feed the, the baby so either formula feeding or switching to the other breast and definitely no there's no transmission of or increased risk of breast cancer development in the baby that is being breastfed Okay, Doc, would you take the other two questions? Okay, so it says, what is the probability of recurrence of cancerous cells after being diagnosed with breast cancer and undergoing treatment? Okay, so the probability of recurrence of breast cancer depends on, one, the stage at which the first cancer was diagnosed, whether it probably spread. Uh, it also depends on the type of cancer that you had. If it's the one that is more aggressive, uh then obviously your chances are increased and um yeah so all these things play a part but one thing is that even if you have had breast cancer and it's being cured in that particular breast you still have an increased risk of developing cancer in the other breast so there's really no fixed probability it depends on a, a number of factors you know that all increase the chances of you developing uh breast cancer in the other breast. So it's to mean that if you have had breast cancer in one breast, you should have a, you know, a high level of, you know, looking to make sure that nothing is happening or occurring in the other breast. So such people truly have very frequent uh, tests and examinations. And there are tests that they do to ensure that the levels of a certain chemical produced you know, for those who have yeah. had breast cancer, it's always within the normal range. So once it stays within the normal range, then it means that there's, first of all, no recurrence of breast cancer within the breast that had the cancer. And at least also gives information that there's nothing also developing in the other breast. So, Adju, I hope that helps. So the second question is by Patrick. He says, if sucking the, the pairs we love may not necessarily prevent breast cancer. What else can men do to protect these pairs? What else can men do to protect these pairs? I think truly um, the best people who can actually ensure that our women uh, do the breast screenings regularly is the, are the men, you know? And because left to the woman alone, sometimes there's a lot of fear, panic, anxiety in going to do your breast examinations. All right. So I think it's really for the men to encourage the women to, you know, go and do that breast screening. It's also for the men to probably even carry out the, the breast examination, the self breast examination for the wife. You know, it can help them easily identify these lesions. And most importantly, it's also for the men to learn a lot around breast cancer so that they can be a better support to their wife. So by learning about breast cancer, by helping conduct the breast examination for your wife and also by ensuring that your partner also carries out the necessary uh, annual screening, the ultrasound, the mammogram, and even the clinical examinations every year to ensure that he or she is safe. And I think with this, I really would like to uh, mention that on the 21st of October, there's a free breast screening here at uh, the CELAB headquarters we it's it's a men's thing so we are advising the men to come and bring their partners along so it's it will be about and we'll also be having a talk which would be men talking about breast cancer and the role of men in handling breast cancer so we would like to invite all men come with your partners and let's sit down and talk about breast cancer and what we can do to you know win over this this disease thank you i think that's about it with the questions the messages So there's one more that just came through from Elizabeth. It says, should a breastfeeding mom be worried about her swollen armpits? Um, should a breastfeeding mom be worried about swollen armpits? Truly, like I answered in one of the questions, it's, 
it could be, you know, due to so many factors, a swollen armpit, you know, and if it just developed in the during the period of breastfeeding, it's very unlikely to be due to a breast cancer, you know, but if you notice a swelling in your armpit, you'd want to get it investigated. One, it could be an infection, you know, and two, indeed, it could be another condition that is not cancerous. And three, it could be cancerous. So I'd say that the first thing is to just see a doctor. Let us get to know more about the, the swelling. Let us then be able to, you know, tell whether it's probably due to an infection or something else and put in the appropriate treatment. In the case that upon the consultation, we realize that this is something out of the ordinary, looking more like a cancer, because yes, you can be pregnant and there could be a cancer and sometimes maybe it may show itself more, you know, during the pregnancy or after the pregnancy. And at least with that, we can see it, we can determine, we can pick it out early at that point and begin to uh, investigate it better and institute the appropriate treatment uh, at the right time to, to, to get a, at least a very good outcome uh, from the treatment. So the key thing is that please let it be investigated by a doctor and then the appropriate management put in place. Okay, I guess there are no further questions. Abigail. Yes, no. Yes, no further. No oh, further. Yeah, yes, so, so maybe you can ask your questions. Okay, 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 okay. So uh, have you told them the price? What's the price? Oh, um, a free ultrasound scan, breast ultrasound for two okay. people. Yeah. Two people. Okay. So that's one for each person, right? Yes. Okay. So my first question is that, what is the percentage of people who uh, experience pain and and as a result of the pain are diagnosed with breast cancer? Or better, perhaps, what percentage of people diagnosed with breast cancer ha had the complaint of pain? I, th I mentioned it during the presentation. So, okay. Someone got it. The I person who got it is, 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 is disqualified. She's a staff. <laughs> So I think the next person is Elizabeth Kujino. Elizabeth Kujino. So the answer is 1%, 1%. And I think that goes to Elizabeth. That goes to Elizabeth. Okay, and my second question is that people who have BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation, by what percentage does it increase the risk of developing breast cancer? compared to somebody who does not have the gene mutation. For a, pers a woman who has the BRCA1, BRCA2 gene mutation, by what percentage is the person more likely to develop breast cancer than another person without the gene mutation? No, it's not 50%. Oh. oh. Sorry, Adra, Adra says she's not a staff. Exactly, so please, yeah. Yes, then Adra, you, please, the, it goes to you. There's also an Adra in our company, so we correct that, Adra, that goes to you. So the percentage is not 50%. Not 60, please. It's much, much smaller than that. <laughs> no, it's not 20 it's not 20. so while while we wait for the answer ajua can you kindly um email email us with your telephone number we'll get in touch with you and arrange your 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 price i've just i've just dropped the email address here enquiries.ghstandup.com kindly email us with your telephone number so we can get in touch with you thank you Okay, I think people are not getting the answer correct. So I think I have to change. Look, your question is too difficult. Oh, is it too difficult? Examine that. Uh. Okay, I'll ask a simple one. Edith was very close. No, actually, Stephen was very close. Okay, Echampo, you have to choose one. Francis Echampo, you have to choose one. Okay, so Elizabeth got it. Elizabeth got the answer. 
So Elizabeth has redeemed herself. So Abigail, I think Elizabeth got the answer. So it's 5%. So, yes, so okay. anybody who has the BRCA gene is five times more likely mm -hmm. to develop breast cancer compared to another person who does not have the BRCA gene mutation. Thank you so very much. And uh, I think I'd just like to end by, you know, saying that breast cancer is, is very, very real. I mean, sometimes you never know it's real until it comes very close to you or sometimes it hits very close to home, all right? Um, so it's really to advise all of us, especially our women, that please, it would be very, very painful to, you know, later on hear that you've got breast cancer and it's in a late stage when you knew that all it took to prevent it was to do self-breast examination and to do your annual breast screening. So I'd really like to, that we, we do not exempt ourselves, that if you're a woman on this platform or this uh, presentation and you have not done your breast screening, all right, and after this presentation, you still sit down there, then truly, I don't know what else anybody can say, but then please uh, make every effort to come to Synlab or any nearby place that you can reach to do your breast screening. And at least be sure that at least for now to the next uh, period of your screening, yeah, in, in good shape. Thank you so very much. And we look forward to you joining us on our next webinar series. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Bright. It's been very insightful. And thank you very much, our audience uh, and our listeners. We are very grateful that you were able to make time. And um, we will send out our next notice or the next webinar. So just look out for us on any of our social media platforms on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Synlab Ghana, you can also follow us so that <clears throat> you get any of these updates as and when we put them up. Thank you so much for making time once again. And all the best to everyone. Thank you.